This program contains subject matter, language, and descriptions of sexual violence that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. I need some beer. I'm a nice person, but there's no question that I'm an alcoholic. I'm getting three beers every single alcohol. Tristan drinks all day, all night. It's out of control. I gotta get a few drinks out of this before I the target. I'm always stressed out. So that's why I pick up a beer can and drink it to make that stress go away. It has me feeling good, boy. It actually takes about a beer and a half to stop the shakes and to feel normal again. And it takes about five more to get actually where I want to be. Tristan is probably drinking at least 12 to 16 of those 22 ounce cans of beer. And then sometimes I'll see the small bottles of hard liquor with it. The toll alcohol has taken on Tristan is, is huge. His face looks leathered. He looks 20 years older than he is. He is so thin right now. He's like over six feet tall and only 100 pounds. He's just deteriorating right in front of our eyes. The helicopter's wonderful. Tristan drinks to the point that he is hallucinating and thinks that he sees people attacking him. Good? I'm not good. When he gets drunk and when he gets mad, he gets more aggressive. It's like a dark cloud when he is drunk. You know, my beer. I honestly don't even know how Tristan is still alive with as much as he drinks and as unhealthy as he is. So, I'm not worried about dying. I don't even care. I don't like thinking about it. Tristan has given up on himself. Our father was full blood Native American. He was from the Choctaw and Muscogee Creek nations of Oklahoma. But our dad was in and out, mostly out, so there was never any stability. The bond between Tristan and his mom was pretty tight. He loved his mama. He loved our mom so much. Our mom loved him to death, and he was her favorite. When Tristan was 13 years old, our mom passed away from pancreatic cancer. It took her so quickly. I lost my mom and I had no idea what to do. I was numb and I hit the wall and everybody was crying and I went outside and just laid there in the grass. And I knew It was over at that point. She was my everything. He did have his big brother, Eric, to look up to. Eric is about six years older than Tristan, and he was charming, confident, athletic, and Tristan really started to idolize him like a father figure. And Eric just, he loved being a big brother. Eric did start to struggle, and he never talked to anybody about it until he finally just couldn't deal with it anymore and he started drinking. Four years after mom died, Eric was in a car accident. My brother was drinking at a party. He decided to drive home and he swerved around a truck and rolled over off the road. He was paralyzed from the chest down for several years before he died. When Eric passed away, I mean, I didn't even feel anything at that point. I was just, I was just numb. Once he starts drinking, that's the only thing that he cares about. Now it's the worst I've seen it. He's been arrested for being drunk in public. DUI. Assault. It's to the point where now he can't really be clean and be productive. Woo. I bought a funeral package because I feel it's only a matter of time before he would drink himself to death. I lost my brother, my mom, my dad, and I feel numb. And my family doesn't understand that. So then I turn to alcohol so I don't have to think about anything. 
only got like 12 looks to my name. So right now I'm staying in my sister's backyard. It's not hard at all. I just sleep on a blanket. I get up early in the morning and I'll go to the park, waste time, drink, get blacked out, come back and then pass out. You want to grab some butts out of there for me? You want to do the dirty work? What? What is it? <gasps> I'm not picking up human poo. That is not normal. It's disgusting. No. Let me pour bleach on it first. OK. We're cleaning up your mess. And there's one area in particular that you can do yourself. What area is that? OK. Your plants. I worry about you, so. I don't think you worry about me. I do. I don't receive love from you or Jessica or Tammy or anybody. But we do love you. But you won't stay sober long enough to talk to Shut us. Shut the up, man. Hey, I didn't mean to make you upset. My name is Michael Gonzalez. I'm a certified intervention professional. We don't want Tristan to have a bottom of death, institutions, or jails. We don't want that for him. He needs alcohol to survive every day. He goes through withdrawals every single day. Yeah. That liquor story right there, it's a, it's a luck that that stoplight, so. He has been drinking, Michael, and it's like they're about five minutes out. OK. Oh, boy. Hey, Chucky. Wow. <laughs> wow, you mother <laughs> Come on in, come on in. Take a seat. Hold up a second. Come on, come on. Come take a seat with us. Yeah, trust me, all right? They just want to talk to you, all right? That's it. For real, come on. This is Michael. Can you just trust me one more time, at least? Hey, Tristan, could I get you to sit down over here, please? Can I bring this beer absolutely. with me? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You must hurt. So I just want you to know, you got a family here that loves you. And I Is really that what appreciate they told you? It. I'm, I'm getting to know this family, and I really appreciate that you're, you're willing to sit here and listen, OK? All right, you're up, Tracy. I've always been so proud to call you my little brother. You have always been so adventurous, spending the majority of your time outdoors, climbing trees and building stuff by yourself. I'm sorry. There were times when you needed me and I couldn't be there for you. <laughs> you never saw me, Jesse. You never saw me. I've seen you become another person. Yeah, yeah, f you. We don't need to do that. This is love. We, need, we don't need to be like that with everybody. If you don't accept this help today, I'm no longer be in contact with you at all. And that's okay, the last thing right. I want to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're not going to be in contact with me again. Hey, Go ahead. Come on, man, calm Please. down. Calm no, down. I don't want to see that. Calm down. You know I love you. Hey. Go ahead. <laughs> calm down. Anything. Calm down. We don't. We don't need to do that. We're not here for that. <laughs> you know I love Tristan, you. we're not here for that, man. This is love. That's the only thing we're here for. If a paper <laughs> tells you that. that you can't be in contact with your brother, you're a piece of. Tristan, come on, man. Tristan, we don't do that. No, we don't do that. We're not going to do that. And this conversation is done, dude. Yeah, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. Oh, my gosh. That scared the crap out of me. I thought maybe you'd be, like, a little bit more sober. Can you go back upstairs? No, we can go outside. Have you ever been through alcohol? I actually absolutely have. How'd that do you? I'm sober 13 years, and I had the life just like you, exactly like you. If I'm able to get out. Anytime you want, man. Anytime you want. We're going to get in the car, go, and if you want to leave treatment and you don't like it, you can leave, man. Nobody's going to hold you against your will. I'll do it Sunday. It's now. we got to go now. He's going to die. <laughs> Everything is arranged for right now. I'm not going to be locked up, though. No. Like on some no. Bull we're getting in the car and we're driving there. Nobody's locking you up, man. So you'll go. Let's give it a shot, man. I'll give it a shot. Proud of you, man. Let's yeah. go say goodbye to the family. Let's get on the road. All right. All right? I appreciate you, man. You can do this, man. You can do this. We're strong. We can get through anything. I love you. Welcome to Legacy Outdoor Adventures. 
So are you ready to start your uh, no, journey? I'm not. Is there any part of you that's curious what this place is about? I don't give a f about this place. Dude, I'm done with this God. Tristan, relax. You can shut your mouth. I don't want to be here. Tristan. A lot of the clients who first arrive here are angry and do not want to be here and have some frustration. However, this degree of anger is unusual. Is there a gas station around? There's a gas station in town. It's a little ways off. OK, so it's, it's, can I get alcohol there? It's closed. There are no all night gas stations here. Yeah, this isn't going to work out. Once you tell me I can't get alcohol, I'm going to hit you right in the face. Can you make it through the night? I can make it through the night, but I can't make it through the day. Let's take one step at a time. Go to bed, get a good night's sleep, get through tonight without a drink. After I wake up, dude, I'm going to be in a whole different mood. When Tristan first arrived, he did not want to stay. He threatened to leave. However, right now, Tristan is 84 days sober and doing remarkably well. The last time I've been sober for this long was eight years ago when I was 18 years old. And it feels really good. Hey, brother. What the Oh, I miss you. I miss you, too. I feel just a sense of relief seeing him and being able to have a conversation with him. <laughs> to see him laugh again it just means the world to me. It's just like my brother is back. So right now, I am actively working on building up those relationships with all of my siblings. How are you feeling? I feel good. I wish it was a bigger repel. Me too, man. After treatment, I plan on going back to construction. And I'm trying to stay more focused on the near future rather than plan way ahead of time, just because the near future is something that I'm more in control of. My name is Diana. I'm 29 years old. I grew up and live currently in Buena Park. So this is the neighborhood I grew up in. This is my parents' house, and I didn't move too far. I ended up renting a room from my neighbor, so this is where I stay. As a little girl, Diana had the most wonderful personality that you could have in a child. She was just, just this little ray of sunshine. Everybody loved her. She had it made. She had to roll by the tail. But around the last year of high school, that began to change. I used to be my parents' dream child. Now, nothing but an alcoholic. Diana drinks day and night. She hides vodka bottles all over the place. <gasps> Merry Christmas. We've at times have found eight or nine vodka bottles empty and half full. <coughs> when I get buzzed, I'm just happy. And I don't have to think about the pain, frustrations, anything that I was upset about that would take that pain away. When Diana was born, I started crying. I was so happy. She was beautiful. And I instantly thought of Princess Diana. Diana was very sweet and happy child. I just thought that she had the perfect little family. Everything was perfect. And I wanted Diana to have everything that I never had as a child. Della came from a very troubled family who were all alcoholics or parents. I promised myself I would never, ever let anything like what I went through happen to Diana. My mom and dad treated me like a little princess. They would always made sure that I always had the best Christmas dress, the best Halloween costume. And so in a way, they overcompensated and kind of over sheltered me. I was kind of like in a beautiful cage. 
When Dinah started kindergarten, we chose a private school that was very close to where her mother works. And she just took off like a rocket ship. She just excelled. She was always one of the best students. She was just this wonderful child that everybody loved. And I just kind of let my parents take control and make that decision for me. It was almost like I was in this bubble. And even though I hated living in this bubble, I was too afraid to just venture outside it because I didn't know what was out there at the time. But I realized I wasn't happy at the high school I was at because I was so isolated. I'm sure everybody's heard of the mean girl aspect. Well, here you have Diana, tall, beautiful, and extremely smart. There was a lot of jealousies with the girls there. And that had an adverse effect on Diana. By my junior year, I couldn't take it, but then I didn't want to disappoint my parents. And that's why I continued to stay. When I was interning, I had this guy who was about in his mid-30s giving me attention and me being at this all-girls school, wow. This man was married with a child, and I happened to see her phone. And I saw pictures of her genitals and her breast, and they were sent to that man. I broke down. Growing up, people thought I was a little most perfect, and then eventually, I just rebelled. Right around the time when she was with that man, everything hit at once. She was cutting herself. It was a, an emotional release for me. But she was still getting straight A's. And Diana graduated high school with 4.2 GPA, was accepted into UCI, and you know started on her track. When Diana graduated from high school, uh, we, as a gift to her, we sent her to Italy with some of her friends. And that's when the drinking began, because in Italy, they let teenagers drink. I had not had that type of freedom. It was great. When Diana came back from Italy and started the university, and I detected that something was going on in her life then. Her semester grades were Bs and Cs. And at that time, I was drinking a lot. I contacted the university police, and I said, just give me an idea if she's going to class or not. And he checked on a couple occasions, and of course, Diana wasn't in class. And we tried to pull the rain on even tighter, and that's when those stories came up. We didn't believe her because uh, we did keep a close eye on her. And of course, we're not going to let her hang around any boys that are 13 or 14 years of age. They denied that that ever happened because they didn't want to think that they failed. It just must feel awful to not be believed as something horrible as that to happen to you. I couldn't imagine. Her drinking became a deeper problem. At 21, she got a DUI. She passed out at an intersection. Despite all of this turmoil, she landed a great job with an oil refinery company. She insisted on moving out into an apartment, and that was the start, Party City. Once she was released from that cage, she just didn't know what to do or how to live. I found out later she was taking water bottles to work, but they were bottles filled with vodka. She escalated by calling all these men and they would meet in a parking lot and have brief sex for payment for alcohol. We put Diana there thinking we could, you know, keep an eye on her and get her some help. And she went on a drinking binge and she got sick. She got progressively worse. She couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. It was the worst that I've ever seen her. She became completely paralyzed, and we took her over to the emergency room. Her neurologist said that this was the worst case of the Korsorkoff syndrome that she or any of her colleagues had ever seen. She had to have a feeding tube. Open your valve. Open. It was awful. Two days after Diana came home from the hospital, she took vodka, poured it down her feeding tube, passed out, and they took her to the hospital for 
alcohol poisoning. Her liver is in very bad condition, and uh, all of this drinking is also affecting her heart. I don't think she realizes that it's going to be over if she doesn't get help. I'm going to see if there's anything on TV. God, it looked like a animal. Diana does not want to go anywhere else outside of her own room. Ah, there it is. And she does shots of vodka every single day. Rock and roll. I don't know why the police don't take her anymore. You can be arrested for public intoxication, and she should be. I don't know why she hasn't been. I can remember when you were that cute little girl with curls, that beautiful smile running around. But when you were in the hospital and you were dying, you couldn't eat, you couldn't speak. You only visited once. Yes, because I couldn't see you sitting in there dying. Please, please get this help. You're dying. But if you don't, I'll tell your landlord, I'm not gonna give him a penny. And if you come on the property, I'm gonna have you arrested for trespassing. I don't wanna do this, Diana. Please go with Ken. I'm gonna be going to treatment because of the wrongdoings that I've had, because of the control that I had over you. And you need to do this because I know you want to live. Do you wanna to listen to your mom's letter? Sure, sure. Diana, I love you more than anything. You know, as a little girl and for many years and as a teenager, we would say I love you every day to each other. Everything you did, you were great at. But alcohol's robbing you of all of that, Diana. All of your beauty, all of your soul. It's taking everything away from you. And now I have another person that I've lost to alcohol. That's not fair. It's not fair. See? It's not fair that it's, alcohol. It's all about you. No. It's all about you. All about you. No. It's taking what? 30 years for you to finally, finally admit that you guys are controlling that I've been saying for years. Talking about this rehab and everything for me and everything. It's too little, too late. Well, wait a minute, Diana. Just sit down because you're right. You're exactly right. Your addiction is alcohol, yes. right? Their addiction is controlling you. I'm so sorry, but I want you to be help. I want you to be an independent person, and this is the way for it. It's a beautiful facility, Diana. I'll be there for you. I'll be there, whatever you need. If we can come need. and see you, we'll come we and see will. you. I don't, I don't love you. Let me finish. Yeah. Please let I'm me finish. Controlling. Controlling. You're right on, and you shouldn't have and to it's... live this way, but they're willing to get the help. I'm, I'm going to go smoke a cigarette. Go with her. You know my parents, they're so bullshit. they're bullshit him right now. They're just doing it for the cameras. She wants to defer like she's always done and try to blame everything else except the alcohol. Yep. And that's what she's doing now. You've been smothered for 30 years. Everybody sees how sick your dad is. He needs a lot of help. And so does my mom too. And your mom, absolutely. They're both up. Yes, but your mom, I think, gets it. Your dad's not seeing it right now but I need you clean and sober so you and I could go to bat for that if you even choose to. You may choose to just stay away from them and live a healthy life on your own. You're the victim in all this. It's not jail. The place is beautiful. Mm -hmm. You won't want to leave after 90 days. I mean, if I go longer, I go longer. Yeah, yeah, no, but try it. But I'll give just... it two weeks. I am so proud of you. Let's get going. Do this, Diana. I'm so Physically, I feel healthier. Mentally, just feeling more in control of my feelings. And emotionally, not letting things bother me as much as it used to be. So I've really grown from that. At this point in time, I am not speaking with my parents. Unfortunately, they have not taken any initiative to work on their own recovery. I definitely feel more positive about my future. Being in recovery has helped motivate me to really push even more for that fairy tale happy ending. Maybe not in the time frame I'd like it to be, but I know I can make it work.
Joshua, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm 34 years old. Joshua's a very smart man, very intelligent, very articulate. I knew what I wanted out of life very early on. How many other kids have you ever seen that have bought a house, have a family at 21? We were the happy family. You know, all we were missing was a white picket fence. He was very, very successful. I bragged about him to everybody. Never hear it anymore. I know. I got to get back to it. It was a again. lot of fun. He lost everything he had, and it all kind of happened within a uh, one or two year period. I was about 32 years old when I moved back in with mom. Love you. Be good. Good more. My son Joshua is an alcoholic. Well, on top of just having an addiction that takes everything away from my life, I have an additional layer. It's kind of a weird thing. It's like one of the people that eat, you know, sofa cushions or something like that. Joshua is addicted to hand sanitizer. Joshua will drink hand sanitizer nearly every single day. He drinks anywhere from 12 to 28 ounces. All I do is add some water to it. I have drank it completely 100% straight before, uh, but the consistency is, uh, I just, I can't. It's like loogie stuck in your mouth all the time. It's not... It never crosses your mind to think that someone would use hand sanitizer to get high. I just couldn't imagine drinking something so thick and gulping it down, it actually makes me sick to my stomach. After I've had one entire bottle, I can actually drink the second bottle completely straight. Hand sanitizer is everywhere. A standard size bottle is actually eight ounces. This is like the most prominent ones that you see on like desks and stuff all over the place. Three and a half shots for $1.39. I don't know any bar in the world that would do that. I'm a binge drinker. I've put myself in some alcohol poisonous type situations very quickly. Hand sanitizer is really dangerous because it's not designed for human consumption. I have no idea what's happening to my brain and my body from all the inactive ingredients. He's going to drink it all, whatever's there. It's a race to the bottom of the bottle. It's destroying him, inside and out, outside and in. He's been in the hospital at least a dozen times in the last three or four months. His heart, liver, kidneys, internal organs is being affected by this stuff. He has seizures. He's been on life support. He's almost gone blind. I live in fear that the phone's going to ring and he's going to be dead anytime. If someone had told me years ago that Joshua would grow up to be addicted to hand sanitizer, I would have called him crazy. There's no way, no way my son, my successful son, would drink hand sanitizer and like it. The day Joshua was born was a surprise. He was born six weeks premature. He was a little teeny itsy bitsy thing. He was a happy baby, very easy going child, but there was a lot of fighting going on between Joshua's father and I. So I left and left the children with their father. I raised him from the age of two to 15 with his father, Gary. He was a great, well-mannered uh, kid growing up through the years. Never got any mischief, any trouble. In New York, I grew up in a very small town. Our school was K through 12, and it had about 300 students total. A lot of the people around there were very country and very into hunting, but I liked to play guitar and listen to music, and I didn't quite fit in. The summer in between 9th and 10th grade, I was 15 years old. I decided to move in with my mother. Florida it was super dynamic, and it was great, and it gave me the opportunity to reinvent myself. Joshua flourished. He took music lessons. He was an A-B student. He excelled at the courses he took. When he went to college, 
I didn't worry about him ever drinking or smoking or getting in with the wrong crowd because I knew the person he was. He wanted to go to college, get a good job, get a house, and then find the love of his life. When I met Joshua, he was working at a convenience store. He was happy and funny and very knowledgeable, and he had the gorgeous blue eyes. I just melt every time I would look into him. I told her that I was 23 years old because I thought that would be believable. And she said she was 27. So, okay, cool. On our second date, I decided to tell the truth and say, hey, just so you know, I'm 19 years old. And she said, what, you're a teenager? And then she stormed off. And then I called her later and said, hey, that's only four years, what's the problem? She said, well, I lied too, I'm 33. So when we met, we were only four years apart, but by the time we were in love, we were 14 years apart. It didn't seem like I was dating a 19-year-old. A lot of people frowned upon it, but I didn't care, and he didn't care. I fell in love right away, and I fell in love with our kids right away. I wasn't thrilled at all with the relationship in the beginning. This older woman was taking my son and having him become a father right away at 19. I found a house that I wanted to buy. I closed on it when I was 21 and we moved in. He landed a great job. And within a year, he got promoted and was in charge of 14 different convenience stores. I was very proud of him. When Joshua was 27, he decided to have gastric bypass to help with the weight loss. Joshua didn't lose weight as quickly as he wanted to. He couldn't exercise because he was having back issues. I ruptured one disc and then herniated another. I was prescribed hydrocodone, quite a bit of it, like 100 pills a month for about eight months. I got really used to it and started using it in a manner that was not prescribed to me to make me feel happy. After the back surgery, he was feeling better. So they quit prescribing it and that's when he went to street drugs. I was doing all of them from hydro to oxycodone and fentanyl, like just the whole list of prescription. Alcohol was another thing that he started doing. And with the two of them mixing, he would pass out drunk, swear up and down he's not drinking, but you could tell he's drunk. My addiction became my number one priority, and I was drunk all the time and just not a good husband, and I was not a good father. Joshua was in and out of rehabs, but he couldn't stay clean. The more I fought to get him better, the more he fought to get away from me and just push me away and push everybody else away. The big problem was that I was just losing everything left and right. Within a one-year span, my children left, I got a divorce, and I lost my job. Somebody in rehab told him how he could do the hand sanitizer, mix it with a little juice so it doesn't taste so bad so you can get drunk. I really don't know what would be worse than drinking hand sanitizer. He had been in the hospital over a dozen times in just the last few months, and I'm terrified that one of these times, they're not gonna be able to save him. There is a point during the drinking phase that I know that I change, that I switch from just talking like I normally would to acting out of anger or act out of paranoia without even considering whether it makes sense or not. <sighs> they used to be a happy drunk. Now he's an angry drunk, and he gets violent. I don't have another drink. Give me, dude. Where's the other bottle? Where the is my drink? I only know of the two bottles, the square one and the one that you were. Damn it! How do you not know what I'm talking about? You're the one that came in and asked me where the I was. You're the one that lifted my mattress and says, where is it? And then picked it up. How the do you not know what I'm talking about? Well, it wasn't a square bottle that I picked up under your. I don't give a what shape it was. Where is it? Hey, honey. I'm so glad you're here.
What's going on? Love you. Me too. Dear Josh, I am here today because I love you. <clears throat> you have so much positive potential for great things that lie ahead for you. I know for a fact you're struggling at this point in your life. I am so afraid for you right now. I am strongly urging you to make an immediate decision and commitment to turn your life around today. Don't give up. I know you can do it. This disease has changed you. The fire in your eyes for life has diminished, and the saddens me. The things like the family or the kids are not as important as getting your next drink. And drugs have made you not care if you live or die. And this scares me. It's time to get help to heal yourself and the family. We've been sick long enough. I'm here to, to tell you that I love you more than you can possibly fathom. But I don't like some of the choices you are currently making. I'm very concerned and afraid that you are killing yourself. I can't and won't sit idly by and be witness to my son's death. Often I've wondered about like what value and what worth I have anymore as a human being because I've lost so much and done so much damage and hurt so many people. The fact that you guys are all here and you write these letters and you visit me shows that I guess I do have a value. Yes, you do. And I do have a worth. So, in an effort to help me prove to myself that I have it, I will gladly accept any <laughs> When Joshua said yes and said he was gonna go, it was the, the happiest moment I've had for a long, long time. We all love you and we know you can do that. I am so relieved and so excited for the first time in a long time, I feel like I can breathe a sigh of relief that he is on the way to recovery. Anthony, Welcome nice to, to the you. Arbor. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I made sure that the treatment center knew to get rid of all the hand sanitizer so they have nothing here. It's all alcohol free. Hand sanitizer is everywhere. It's always in your face. It's available. It's extremely easy to get. So maybe there's a slight concern that I have that I'll be tempted after I get out, but I'm hoping that this is going to help me kind of absolve and learn how to abstain from that. Physically, I feel fine, and my memory is starting to return. I am remembering things better. I am quicker to solve problems. What's been the hardest thing for you these first couple weeks? After I'd been here like seven days, um, there was an opportunity to take hand sanitizer from a outside meeting that we were at and I just took it without even thinking. That relapse kind of made me realize that this is something beyond what I can control. I'm so proud of you for realizing that and just digging in deeper. My name's Jackie. I am 45 years old, and I live in Belfont, Pennsylvania. I have two beautiful boys, Caleb and Blake, who, of course, mean the world to me. <laughs> Growing up, my mom really just wanted to make sure that me and Caleb knew that she cared and that she would always be there for us. My daughter, Jackie, was a great nurse. She loved her job. She loved taking care of people. She was good at it. Come here. I love you. Now Jackie is as low as she can possibly go. And my mother is an alcoholic. Her alcohol addiction has overtaken my memory. The only memory that I have is my mom sitting on the couch with a glass of wine in her hand. She loves white wine. She said it's just like heaven on earth. I 
drank two bottles like this yesterday, and then a box, which is almost like instant little keg in your fridge. She's not a happy drunk. She gets very mean. You're treating me like a child. Alcohol now is a part of her physical makeup. She has to have that alcohol in there in order to function. This pile here is Bill's. They've been laying there. I actually got this certified the other day. I had to sign for it. I did not open that up yet. I don't pay for, for some of the things that I should be paying for because I'm afraid that I'm going to run out of money for wine. She's going to drink herself to death. She's my baby girl. And think that we could lose her because of alcohol. Oh, it, it just, it, it, it tear, tears me apart. Jackie was our first child, and everyone was just crazy over her. Jackie was the, the spunky, outgoing one. I think that we had a regular, normal childhood. Growing up, she was the cool sister. We had a typical American family. All my kids had good grades. They were wonderful children and a lot of joy with them. I hate to say this because I love my dad, but my dad truly was never there. If he wasn't working, he was, you know, at the bar. I'm a uh, Vietnam vet. I was a door gunner in a helicopter in Vietnam. I seen death, destruction, and killing. So trying to forget that, I, I turned to drinking. I remember worrying about him and thinking, OK, is this the second or third night my dad's not been here? And I would lay there in bed and think, oh, god, I hope he didn't wreck, or I hope he's OK. The family that I love to go and have dinner with just fell apart. I met Jackie through a mutual friend, and we started dating. He was a high school wrestler, and she was a cheerleader for the wrestling team. And that was probably one of the happiest times I remember her. He was a nice guy. He was calm and laid back, a good catch. I thought we were a good match. We dated for so long. I mean, it was off and on seven years. When Jackie got her RN, I would say it was a big deal. Patients loved her, her coworkers loved her. I was very proud, we all were. That was a great accomplishment. Jackie's life did look wonderful. She was a good mother. Her and Kayla both seemed happy. I realized early on in my marriage that I didn't feel that I was as happy as I should be. I knew he was gonna be a good dad, but I think at one point, I almost became jealous of the kids. Like, why don't you want to spend time with me? Like, what's wrong with me? Jackie told me she asked him for a divorce, and Caleb wouldn't give it to her. He said no. It would be better if we just stayed together and worked it out, got through it. I was trapped. So she just decided to stay and live with it. And I think that's when she started drinking. If she wasn't happy in life, then that's what she did. She would drink. Drinking made everything seem just a little bit better. But when the drinking started, everything just got worse, progressively worse. I can recall Jackie showing up at sporting events for our children intoxicated. I would find bottles of wine stuffed in behind her sweaters in the closet. Jackie was the epitome of a functioning alcoholic. I started thinking it was OK to get in my vehicle and drive. Her explanation to me was, I made her drink. She was that unhappy. So after being married 18 years, we finally got a divorce. After Jackie's divorce, things did not get better. Jackie has lost just about everything she ever had because of her addiction. My mom chose a lot of things over Blake and I. One being alcohol, she chose that over us. And I feel kind of betrayed in a way. You gonna be at my graduation this week? Yeah. Well, what time do you guys have to be there Saturday? Uh, 10.30. Oh, you have to be there at 10. I figured you'd have to be there a little earlier. She said she would make it to my graduation, but I don't believe her. She's usually drunk when she wakes up. Thank you. But every day, I wish I could have her back to where she, where she used to be.
It's terrible, it sucks. That she's picking a glass of wine over me. It just concerns me what it's doing to your body. It's fine, Marie. I'm just looking out for you. I'm good. Not <laughs> right now, you're not. Wow, I am. How are you gonna be tomorrow morning? I'm gonna be fine. She's drunk, and if she continues drinking, I won't allow her to go to graduation because she can't go and embarrass her son in front of his whole entire class and family. Counting on you. What you're saying here tonight. I know. Well, so what's gonna go wrong? <laughs> then her friend was texting her. She used to date him when we were teenagers. And before I knew it, they were in the bedroom and I was out here and I had to sit and listen to it. Jackie. And he's still here and she's still sleeping. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to get her up and ready to go to graduation or not. Hey. Hey. Jackie needs to get up. You ready? Bye. You need to start getting ready. What time is my dad coming? 9.45. <sighs> Today is her son's graduation from high school. And if I wasn't here with her this morning, she would still be in that bed sleeping and not even worrying at all about making it to her son's graduation. I'm anxious about seeing my ex-husband, who I despise. I just want to get drunk and not go to this, but I can't. Well, I hope it goes well. My relationship with Jackie today is probably the best it's ever been, because at this point, she needs me, and I want to help her. You ready? Watching him graduate it was like overwhelming. It seemed like yesterday that he was just a baby and he was hanging off my leg. So when I look back, I see a lot of wasted years. Love you, babe. I haven't been what a mom's supposed to be because of my drinking. Wait, one more. My ex and I did not make eye contact today. We took a picture with the kids and I. Let's smile. And we all smiled and we all looked happy and that was it. Caleb actually thanked me for coming to his graduation, even though that's something that a mom should normally do. He knew it was difficult for me to get there and I got there, but I'm so glad I could just leave. <clears throat> Dear Mom, <clears throat> my sole purpose for being here is to help you get better. It's been a long time since you've been happy. Your addiction has been keeping you from succeeding and making us happy. I still remember all the good left in you that's made an impact on everyone in this room. I want this addiction to end for all the bad memories to go away. Even though I love you more than life itself, I can't stand being around you and watching you destroy your liver and slowly killing yourself. I miss you, Jackie. I miss you so much. Your family misses you. And your beautiful sons miss you so much. I know you love us as much as we love you. Now it's time for you to show that love. Can I have a drink? <laughs> Mom, you need to do this. You need to go through with this. We all love and care about you. We want you to get help. Jackie, will you go to treatment with me today? Today? Today. Like right now, today. Mm -hmm. We've got everything taken care of. Don't worry about a thing. 
and you're going to go away and get well for yourself and for your family. This could very well be your last chance to live. Okay. You're going to California. It's a long flight, and yeah, we're gonna take care of you. You're gonna be traveling with a nurse, and we got your back, baby. Okay, trust me, we got your back. Is that a yes? Good. Good. Yes. Oh. 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 Nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, Mom. Seeing my mom today was probably the greatest feeling I have for the past few months. I am feeling very good about the future for the first time in a long time. It's good, and I want to be that person. You know, I don't want to go back to what I was. We need to see if she lives here or what not. What am I doing? This is my house. Why am I being arrested? My name is Abby. I'm 26 years old, and I live in Marquette, Michigan. One of Abby's favorite things to do was taking pictures. I've always been very artistic. She has a really keen eye for an interesting perspective that other people probably wouldn't normally think to take. Abby has a five-year-old daughter named Delia. Can I play that part for me? Mm -hmm. My parents have temporary guardianship over my daughter. We decided to do that about a year ago because Abby was not a fit parent. Delia is my entire world, but I haven't been able to be a successful mother. Abby is an alcoholic. Her drinking has now progressed from drinking on a regular basis to shooting up meth and heroin. When I first met Abby, she was definitely one of the most beautiful girls I have honestly ever seen. She is just drop dead gorgeous. And then within the last year or so, she cut all of her hair off, stopped bathing regularly, wears the same clothes every day. Abby's drinking is ravaging her. <laughs> she has ended up in the emergency room three or four times with blood alcohol levels as high as 0.45, which is enough to kill the average human being. I have stage two kidney failure, stage one liver failure. My pancreas is not well. <laughs> I was super excited to be a big sister. From the moment Abby was born, she was my best friend. We did everything together. What you doing, Abbers? Wow. Are ya? Abby loved being outside, doing some adventures with us, camping, canoeing, skiing. Growing up, Abby was in dance, she was in choir. She always had a lot of friends, too. She was kind of the center of attention a lot. Abby is a fashion statement. She likes to stand out in the crowds. She went with the blue hair for a while and always did quite a bit of makeup. She was always left for the party and was much more interested in her social life than she was passing her classes. When Abby was 18, she graduated from high school. She wasn't really ready to, to make the transition from high school to college classes, so she went and started working full time. When I was 19, I was working at a restaurant in Marquette and that's where I met Ray. We pretty much started dating immediately. She used to take me everywhere and introduce me to everybody. 
We were both very, very happy. We were really in love. When Abby was 20, she found out that she was pregnant with Delia. She became like an insta-mom. She <laughs> started nesting and she just went into hyperdrive about being a mom. Somewhere after Delia was about a year, things seemed to be askew. Ray and Abby fought constantly. Ray would get in Abby's face about the littlest things. Once that baby came, he turned into a monster. It started as like a jealousy thing when I first started going back out, you know, like, I'm going to go out with my girlfriends tonight. It just seemed like she didn't want to be a family. He thought that I was, like, cheating on him or something. I came home late from work one day, and he threw me down a staircase and locked me in the basement for, like, 12 hours. One time, we went to a restaurant, and my co-worker had called me, and he thought it was just some random guy. One minute, I was sitting there asking her who she was talking to, and then the next minute, I was punching her in the face. And he punched me so hard, my face was literally concave. In hindsight, everything is so clear and obvious, but at the time, somehow we didn't see it. I believe the physical and mental abuse continued for about two years. He poured a boiling hot pot of soup on me, and I made the decision to call the police. Despite what had happened, Abby was very insistent that Ray be a father and raise his daughter, even if they weren't together. Brent and I didn't think Ray should have contact, and Abby was adamant that Delia needed her dad. And it wasn't my choice to make. When the physical abuse started with Ray, I started drinking heavily. Abby's drinking started as an escape and then progress more into a lifestyle. When he went to jail, he went for two days on a severe domestic violence charge. And I've been in jail for like 130 days for my cocaine charge. Right after Abby was in jail, she got out and immediately started right down the same track she was at before. Wes is currently Abby's boyfriend. They have known each other for a year. He's very good to me. He paid off my felony fines. Wes has never been able to tell her no, and Abby fully takes advantage of that. Staying at Wes's provides her an opportunity to use without judgment. Abby's drinking affects Delia. Um, a lot more than what Abby realizes. She's getting progressively worse. And Delia is becoming more aware that her mom's not around. With Abby driving while intoxicated, it's just a matter of time now before she ends up hurting someone or herself. No, just give I'm me not my keys. You drive. No. I'm not going to let you get arrested, Abby. I'm sorry, that's the last thing you need right now. Just hop, just, in, your, just just hop in your car. I'll car. drive you yes. home. Oh, all of you. Hello, love. Hold on. Okay. You can sit down, please. Hmm? Can you come sit down, please? Hi, babe. I swear to God, if this is like some sort of intervention bullshit, I'm gonna spaz out. I'm here for you today. Because I'm afraid of losing you forever. <laughs> and there's been a lot of tragedy in your life. It breaks my heart that I couldn't protect you. It breaks my heart that I can't help you now. Please get help today. I'm so worried every day that today might be the day I lose my daughter. I worry if you don't die, you're going to end up in prison and what it will do to Delia. I want you to get on the plane today and get help. So what their hope is today is that you'd go to this place. It's called BRC Recovery, and it's for 90 days in Texas. 
I'm nice. not gonna go today, I'll go tomorrow. So unfortunately, that's a no to us, and... Okay, why is it not up to me to leave tomorrow? Because everything's booked today, and we gotta get in the car, and we have to head down to the airport. We respect your decision, that's okay. You know, nobody's here to force you to do okay, anything. Okay, hey, when am I supposed to leave then? We have to leave 10 minutes. Well, if we're gonna leave in 10 minutes, I need to go see Wes and tell him I'm leaving. Is that okay? We don't have time for that. Well, then no. I can leave right now. Please, we have, just listen we have to enough us. time for us to talk this I was just told gonna... 10 minutes. We listen. have time we to have do what noon. we need. We're gonna be in the car by noon. So we just have enough time to say what we need to say. Okay, then... well, hurry the up then. If you choose to leave treatment early, you don't go today, then there has to be consequences in your life, and that's what the next part is. Okay, can we hurry the f up, please? We will not have contact with you. You will no longer be in our wedding. You will not be invited. Lastly, we will contact CPS today if you do not go. You will not be allowed to see her until you test clean for six months, and you will start with supervised visits with yes. someone. I'm, no, so I'm, you no. want to call CPS now? No, I'm going to go. Because that's what they're going to do if you walk out. This is what happens. This is not fair. This is not fair to me. It's... If you quit arguing, we have time for you to see Delia. It's you. I'm out. Abby, please. Abby, please don't go. Yeah, Abby. Come on. Fast, fast, fast. Abby, 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 come no. here. Get the oh, out of my car. Listen to me. You don't realize how serious they are. You will not see your daughter anymore. I was not prepared for this. I understand, Abby. It was a surprise, so give me 10 Can't minutes. Can't give you 10 minutes. If you leave right now, you don't get to see your daughter anymore. We're trying to help you. Would you rather say goodbye to Dee Dee or Wes? I would choose my daughter personally. All of you, by the way, you guys. I said I would go to treatment. Is it okay to bring your daughter here? Abby? Yup. We've got our people here. Hi, Deedles. Did you have fun? Hi, baby girl. Hey, I gotta tell you something. I gotta go away for a while. Where are you going, Mama? But you know I'll be back, okay? Abby's potential is endless. She has a chance to start over for her and Delia. Today, I am 60 days sober, and I'm feeling more hopeful than I felt in a very long time. Ow. <laughs> yes! I was so excited to see her. She looks awesome. She's going to be so excited when you're home. <laughs> I just miss so much with her. Like, three years. I just don't want to miss any more stuff. My life was taken control of by substances, and now I've been given a second chance to be the best person and mom to my child that I can be, and I won't let her down again. My name is Kayleen. I am 25 years old and I'm from Helena, Montana. Jealousy will be the death of me. Playing music is just an expression of myself and it helps me escape. Kayleen was absolutely obviously gifted in playing music, writing music, singing music. She can compose songs. She's got a lot of different songs already written. My daughter Kayleen is a drug addict and alcoholic. I drink every day. Whatever I can afford, it could be six pack of beer, it could be 
tequila, seven shots of whiskey. It doesn't really matter. Whatever I can get, I will do. This is six beers already. Mm -hmm. When Kayleen drinks, she gets to the point of no control over herself. I've never made a sand angel. I've never made a sand angel either. In terms of drugs, it's the same way. Whatever I can get, I will do. Like cocaine or pain pills or molly. Kayleen doesn't have a job and doesn't have money, so she does manipulate the young men around her, and they're more than willing to pay for her drugs and alcohol. To the age of three, I raised Kayleen on my own. I was a single parent. When Kayleen was 11, she had told me that a relative had been um, molesting her for years. I kind of just had to shut off. Everything changed. I put Kayleen immediately in therapy. But how do you get a child's innocence back? And how do you... How is she going to trust anyone again? All the children met, they did get along great. In fact, they played well together and it worked really well. It was so amazing to have a real healthy family. During this time, we were just waiting for, to go to court. Kayleen was a mess. It was really, really sad to watch. It was just my daughter's word against his word. Just a, a, a child against a monster. I was just, it's over. Just move on, let's move on from this. I swear it looked like all the light went out of my daughter's eyes. She lost all faith in authority or justice. Kayleen started experimenting with drugs and alcohol. Kayleen wasn't going to school. She started using cough syrup and marijuana all the time. So I put Kayleen in therapy. When Kayleen came out of her treatment, I remember how happy and healthy she was. It seemed like she was doing better. And she goes, Mom, I'm just going to go get my GED. And she went, took the test, and got it. College didn't last long for Kayleen because her interests soon turned to drugs, yet again. I started doing cocaine and experimenting with pain pills, acid, basically anything I could find. At first it helped me a little bit, helped me stay up and study, but then cocaine became my main focus rather than school. She just slowly started dropping classes, not showing up and withdrawing. I couldn't do cocaine in college at the same time, so I dropped out. Kayleen's been downhill ever since. She just continually drank and used. And she seems to be doing it every day now, all night and all day, and it's just out of control. Recently, she went out drinking with a friend, and he had sex with her and threw her out of his vehicle in a park where she got a head wound and he left her there to bleed to death. Less than a week later, she was drinking again. Like, did I want to stop drinking? No, just, no. She's just going to continue this never-ending vicious cycle. My daughter is gonna die. I could stop using and drinking drugs if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Vamanos, chica! Vamanos! I've had four beers, a gin and tonic, and a Bloody Mary since 7 o'clock, and now it's 10.30. So you do the math. <laughs>
Kayleen's behavior is out of control. She just takes risks and never thinks about the consequences. Warm! And puts herself in really bad situations. Most of the time when she's drinking, she has no self-control. You never know what's going to happen to her. Like, can I please, like, seriously, can I please come chill at your place, please? Why not? No, like, it doesn't make me act any different, any different than I am. Okay, bye. So I need to take a piss. I can't walk, dude, I'm gonna piss in these bushes. Dude, I'm gonna piss in these mother bushes. I can't walk that far. Jesus. It's gotten to the point where no matter what happens, she's not going to make it very long. Yeah! Hi! Did you get a good rest? Yeah. I'm going to my friend's house, okay? I live a pretty meditative life. I like things sort of cool, calm, and collected. Is he sketchy? Is he sketchy? No way. Wait, it's him calling me now. Yo, what up, cuz? So when drama crosses my path, I, I don't particularly react to it well. You weren't gonna get wasted tonight. I'm not wasted. I'm not wasted, dude. If I was wasted, I'd be punching holes in the wall. I thought you had some commitment to me. I'm not on a written contract here, am I? No one's gonna control me. I can see who I want, do what I want. All I know is I love you, Sam. You care for me and I care for you, but you're going to bed and I'm not, so that's a f deal. Jesus, jealous. F like, it's a free world, it's America. You just got raped by a piece of asshole. He just took advantage of me because I was drunk and then he disappeared. So you were injured while you're in the sex? Not by. Since you started abusing alcohol, I feel like you don't love yourself and it breaks my heart. I don't like seeing you so broken. I feel like you were slowly trying to kill yourself. And I'm so scared. Please take this help today and get on that plane and stay until you get healthy. And I promise to write you and keep in touch. I don't know, I don't know. I know you can do this. I'm so afraid, I don't know. What are you afraid of? Coming back to reality and like facing everything and dealing with everything. Well, you're a victim from that trauma, from being a little girl. And the only way to get out of it is dealing with it through therapy and counseling. Oh. It's not your fault. You deserve an amazing life but you're burying your feelings with the drugs and the alcohol, and it's gonna kill you. Please get on that plane. I freaked out! Please. 
please just get on that plane. Oh. We have to make it work, and this is the chance to make it work. And we'll be there every step of the way, and you know that. Julie, please get on the plane. Wait, you want to ask her again? Yes, I'll do it. I'll do, do it, Blake. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Oh. Oh. Hi, Kaylee. Hi, Kaylee. Welcome. How are you feeling? Right now, I'm thinking about my family. <laughs> I would have never, yeah, I couldn't have done this without them. This is the longest I've been sober since I started using seven years ago. Physically, it's night and day, and I think more clearly, I can plan things out, I'm less impulsive, I feel a lot better. It's about to happen, and it happened today. My mom is a tremendous businesswoman. She's been very successful. She's made millions of dollars. Do I have enough to give them? When she was 22, she was making $22,000 a month. One, two, three. And then parlayed it into about $40,000 a month. I don't think I have enough. My mother was a successful multimillionaire, but now she's got nothing and she's going to die. I would like another drink, please. Can you finish the one you got in front of you? No. My mom is an alcoholic. Where's the vodka, Casey? No, no, I think she's drinking whiskey or rum or something. She doesn't even know how much she's drinking. She has blackouts. She doesn't know how far she goes. Damn it, girl. You're going to die. All she wants to do is sit on the couch with a bottle in her hand. She is extremely filthy, dirty. Her hair is in massive knots. I honestly do not think she's brushed her teeth in two weeks, and you can't sit too close to her because it's not such a pleasant smell. I don't think Casey is gonna make it if something doesn't happen. I think her body has had enough. She's deteriorating, and she's living on vodka, and vodka's not feeding her. I really, really miss the mom that my mom used to be. Casey was a happy child, smart, very popular in school. She was very independent, very smart alecky, very hilarious. Casey wanted to be in business. She was focused, she cared about her future. She was 18 when she got a real estate license. By the time she was 20, she had two or three investment properties. But her greatest goal in life is to be a mom and be a good mom. My mom and I have a really good relationship. She was fun and loving. She was easy to talk to. She gives the best advice. She laughs. She has a contagious laugh. The banker asked her, why in the world would I lend you a million dollars? She had the big hair, big smile, and she just said, well, I meet all the requirements that you're looking for. And at that moment, he looked at me and he said, well, let's go. Let's close this loan. That was her first hotel. Lexi was a year and a half when he walked out, so Casey had to be a single mom, of course, running this business. Casey stayed focused on trying to build her financial success. And that's when she actually met her second husband, Gabe. It turned into a serious relationship, and shortly after, she was pregnant with my oldest son, Gabriel. And we got married and set off to start a family together. And she got pregnant with Dakota. The doctor didn't want to do the surgery to pull those kidney stones uh, in fear that it would put her in premature labor. So he put her on some medications 
uh, some pretty strong medications to keep her from pain and helping her to sleep. One night, Casey took little Dakota to bed with her to nurse him. Oh, I don't know if I can get through this. I remember my mom being in the bathroom for hours just crying. She felt like she had rolled on him and suffocated him. The prognosis of his death was Sid's. He was just like a little, little angel. It went up to his death. I wanted to be there for him. Casey didn't want to talk about Dakota's death, didn't want to face Dakota's death just kept, kept herself numb from feeling anything. Alcohol eventually took over. Her drinking increased, her pill use increased. She's been in the hospital many times for her alcohol abuse. She's had her businesses taken away, her homes taken away, her cars taken away. I have lost millions of dollars. She's had some spells of sobriety caused either by jail time, hospitalization, and in some cases, some short forms of treatment. We always hoped maybe this is it, but she'd always relapse. A few months ago, Casey was sober. She was doing well. Gabe actually rented a house for her so that she could be close to the children. It lasted a few months, but she started drinking again. I keep drinking, and I don't know why. She's gotten out of control. Her liver is failing. Her brain's getting damaged. My mom's going to die. I'm scared to death of not having a nice drink. Okay, Casey, That's I love you so much. You have allowed this crippling disease to ravage your health to near health to near death robbing all of us of your delicious sense of humor your alcoholism has affected my life negatively in the following ways i have made saving your life and nurturing your health my primary focus for many many years i have put you all your needs before my own by enabling you, I have become just as sick as you are. In many ways, I have lots of work to do for me. I cannot be around you if you choose alcohol over developing our healthy and dependable relationship. I need, I need that vodka right here in the pocket so I can have a life, yeah, okay. Casey, I will not allow you in my home if you do not go to treatment and remain sober and complete treatment. I love you so much, honey. <clears throat> Mom, you've lost just about everything that you had going for you, and your health is very depleted. I'm constantly worrying about you and if you're okay. Um, my relationship with Tia has been affected because I put you first, and I don't have a mom. That was painful to hear. If you're not willing to take part in this treatment today, our relationship will change in the following ways. I won't come check on you constantly to make sure you're okay. Nor will I come run to your side when you call me. But I will always love you. Will you accept this gift of love from all of us? Go to treatment today. Yeah, I'll do whatever I have to do to get over this. This is, I mean, this is fight style. <laughs> <laughs> The first thought when I saw my mom was, she just looked beautiful, beautiful. She was glowing. Makes me feel really, really good inside. Gives me hope for, for all of us.
I feel excellent. I feel like I'm just alive. I made a connection from my head to my heart. And sobriety doesn't mean just focusing on alcohol. It's focusing on every aspect of my life. I love you. I love you. And thank you. I want my family to know how grateful I am. They have never given up. After all the times I cried wolf, thank you so much. I love you.